All right, so hi, welcome to the first installment in what I hope will be a series, which for right now, for lack of a better term, I'm calling Hate Hunt. The reason is because I am a notoriously agreeable person, and so I end up liking everything. So my challenge, such as it is, is to find something that I can review that I might not actually like. But the problem is, how do you find something for the guy who likes everything? And so, I have a 2008 Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo behind me. And you would think normally, oh, of course, you know, a Jeep. That'll be an easy target. But me, I like... I don't know. I like the Jetta. I like all the typical, like, trucks we've done. I like SUVs. I like mom cars. I like all of the things. And you want to know why? It's because if it runs, it's great. It's great. And I understand that that makes me technically the worst automotive journalist of all time, as I have my award here that I won for automotive journalism. Ugh. Just ignore it, it's a humble brag. Yuck. All right, so we're gonna go check out this car. Luckily, our wonderful volunteer, Mike, over here has offered us the use of this wonderful, well, you know, maybe not so wonderful, but wonderful in the fact that it exists and it's provably existent. It's right here, I can touch it. I'm not going to because there are acid marks from where battery acid ate through, you know, but those shouldn't still be uh, alive and active and dangerous in any way whatsoever, but I guess we're going to find out. So uh, join me on this adventure as I try to find something that I actually might not like. The first thing I learned when driving the Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo is just how limited my vocabulary is. Because I'm not sure I have the words to truly encapsulate a car that makes me feel the way I felt about myself growing up. Just disappointment spreading out like an unchecked termite problem. A pauper's car in hand-me-down emperor's clothing. A Waffle House Gatsby. Call it exaggeration, call it manifest hypocrisy, but I have no real trouble saying that this is the worst Jeep I've ever driven. But is it the worst Jeep ever made? Is the hate hunt already over after just one episode? Let's talk about perception. What we have here is the bastard offspring of a 90s Grand Cherokee and the deferred dreams of an automaker in spiraling financial straits in desperate need of a bailout. Not just financially, but creatively. But in business, it really seems like the best idea anybody ever has is what if popular thing from our past, but worse. Chrysler sought to evolve what had been an American staple and arguably the progenitor of the SUV craze that was born in the 90s and really took off into the 2000s. But it's a version that doesn't exactly live up to the ambitions of capturing the same market segment with the same sort of passion. Because frankly, it's just not as good as a classic Grand Cherokee. If a 90s Grand Cherokee is the boss when you first fight him, the Laredo is like when you unlock him as a playable character. Just under powered and overhyped. Because you see, the, the engine here is a 3.7 liter that makes 210 horsepower, but feels like a whole hell of a lot less. There is no real kick down here, and the acceleration you get ebbs off pretty quickly, so that what you're left with is the sensation of a college relationship after the trauma bond wears off. Okay, cool, this isn't the worst situation in the world, but also how did I get here and why am I staying? This is a car that doesn't like to roll, if that makes any sense. Oh, so it wants throttle input rather than, yes. like, you can't really coast. See, it does not coast. It wants, it wants you to keep it fed. That's about the best way I can describe it. Where that throttle problem really kind of comes in is when you're trying to merge on a highway and you're already going and it kicks down, but there's really nothing there. The visibility all around, it's, it's just the visibility up, up front, unfortunately. That's, that's the problem. Gonna merge like a mall survivor. Here we go. Oh. That was all. Oh, yeah. You would expect a little more, I would think, considering that this is an unleaded car right now. There's not like a whole lot in it, and there's no real kick down or any sort of like 
accelerant energy, really. It's making a lot of noise and, you know, it's a whole lot of sound and fury signifying nothing. The way the throttle just kind of like, after you're done inputting, it just kind of like gives it a half second and just says, okay, I guess I'm done now. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, it kind of yeah. <laughs> It's like I already. It's like you ask your kid to clean the room, and they pick up like one thing, and then they're done. That's a really, really good comparison. Yeah. Like, I don't wanna. <laughs> oh. You see, you just did. You feel. like I'm driving through oatmeal. That's it's a, like it's going, but it's kind of like sluggish. Yep. Like there's some unseen force holding it back. God, it's just so unfortunate, you know? I mean, yeah, it's a Jeep, but is it though? You see it online, but oftentimes the Laredo is hated for what it isn't. Because like say, the Jeep Compass, people don't think of this as a real Jeep. Oh, it's not an off-roader. Oh, it's not a real 4x4. Oh, it's, you know, it's a V6 or it's the underpowered V8, whatever. But, I don't know. It runs. It, do it does that. I mean, on the one hand, it has similar gas mileage to the Hemi, but you don't get to brag about driving a Hemi. And it's kind of a 4x4 with four-wheel drive, but not really. It's the Quadra Drive 1, which is a system that sort of lacks the refinement of a more modern four-wheel drive because you're not getting things like low range mode. It's just a single speed drive system. And sure, it's full time and it favors the rear wheels with a 48-52 torque split, but no matter the road conditions you're facing, this ratio isn't really changing. The best it can do is switch power between left and right wheels as necessary through open diffs. It's not the end of the world, but I will say the lack of 4-low means you probably shouldn't actually take this off-roading, especially when weather conditions aren't favorable. But then I suppose that's just common sense. I mean, this is an off-roader, but I don't know that you're even necessarily encouraged to use it as one. It's almost like a Jeep for someone who wants to appear rugged and outdoorsy but doesn't actually like going outside. It's like a Jeep for a person who breaks down every time they're exposed to nature, and it happens so often that their nickname is Biodegradable. Oh, I'd love if we could all go hiking together, but I'm sure Biodegradable Bob would find something to complain about. You know, it's one of those things where, yeah, you're not going to get into trouble in it, but you're also not going to be able to do a lot of the things that, well, you're probably not going to be able to tow. It's supposed to tow 3,500 pounds, I think. <laughs> um, I, I'm not quite sure that it can. I wouldn't like to try it. Um, uh, but you know, really, you know, the, the, for what you, I guess you get for what you paid for and well, you know, we didn't pay for a V8. Uh. So Brian was telling me that I could actually come back and give a sort of overview of the third row, but that's the funny part. There isn't one. Uh, it's just kind of this whole situation back here. Although I will say, um, it's more room than I was expecting. Still not a lot though. Uh, it's just kind of this situation this hatch situation with maybe a cubby hole down here well actually it's kind of interesting this is one thing that's actually kind of cool about this if you have something where you want to put something dirty you can actually flip this over and do that like um you know for what for our kids it was actually basically like cleats and stuff like that or sports equipment so it's kind of nice to have that so it doesn't necessarily roll around or you know screw up everything in the back i mean at this point in the vehicle's life it doesn't really matter yeah. but, but, yeah. but back then it was kind of important let's see uh the trim level is the x which i guess just stands for extra bull like heated seats oh i think this was maybe part of the x package X package gets you the rear window. <laughs> so this possibly could be a camera car. If these tie down loops are, nope, nope. They are attached to the f uh, fabric and upholstery. They don't go to the body. Fail, can't be a camera car. But all the features in the world have trouble making up for all the things that have gone wrong with this car. You mentioned a, li a bit about swollen nuts. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it does suffer from swollen nuts. A lot of the Jeeps from this time period, um, they, they, from the factory, they came through with, uh, like, you, they were just regular, they were chrome effect nut, uh, lug nuts. They were basically caps on the top of regular nut, lug nuts. And after time, you know, heat up, cool down, heat up, cool down, they kind of tend to weld themselves to the studs. And it happened several times where basically you, they went, you know, you try and take a tire off or what have you, and the thing would either strip out the uh, stud or it would actually just snap it off. And uh, one time at least, uh, we actually had to torch one off. So the evidence of that is actually on the, the one wheel as well. Yeah. So what else would we have? We've had locked up calipers. Um, some of the evidence of that is on uh, one of the wheels as well this side residual evidence of the locked up caliper here which is basically when the caliper locked up it kind of just ground off the uh, what you see in there is basically just metal that has uh, flaked off and welded itself to the wheel because the caliper locked on to uh, to the the, the rotor and uh, well yeah that's that's basically just rotor that's a part of the wheel now how'd you find out it was doing that before? my son told me <laughs> Yeah. My son told me it's making a my son told me it's making a funny sound and it's not really rolling right. And when I came home, it's like, yeah, it's not really smelling right either. So I realized I left my transmission fluid dipstick in here. And that's because uh, back when these were made, and probably even now, um, they didn't put a transmission fluid dipstick on this vehicle. So you had to go out and either go to the dealer or source your own ex somewhere else. So that's what I did. Is there a tube, a dipstick tube? There's, yeah, there's a tube. They got everything there except for the dipstick. So what they do? They just plug the tube? No, they put a little cap on the end of it and said, "Go to the dealer and have them do it." What? Yeah. What? <laughs> For an eight cent part? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I always thought this was kind of a dumb design. When they put the metal together in the back of here, the metal doesn't kind of lap over and stop. It kind of just meets at the bottom and it's welded at the bottom. So what happens is, you know, if you're around uh, like around here where you get like salt and what have you in the wintertime, it kind of just collects underneath here and you can see the result of that. Um, that's unavoidable. I usually try and keep the thing washed or have kept the thing washed but it's still ate it anyway i mean there's some stuff you can never see and that's what happens when you don't see it what you really need something like this for is um i guess hauling capacity for hauling things but also including people mm -hmm. um but <laughs> mainly is just snow and inclement weather and you know why am i pointing the gopro out at the field i don't mm -hmm. know why am i doing anything maybe i just don't want it on my face wow i'm really bad at this um yeah i think a lot of it has to do with just wanting to sort of be in a middle ground between having an suv but having options of sort of being able to go other places and not feel limited of course but then with the lack of four low don't get yourself into too hairy a situation exactly. <laughs> you know um i remember there was a car we were reviewing once way in the early days of rcr where snow was blanketing the ground and there was a small incline to get up a hill and the car got stuck so mike you were telling us about how this has very bad front visibility owing to some blind spot issues yeah i mean one of the things that we noticed from driving it uh, my wife noticed it first and then when my son started to drive it he noticed it and i sure did too um it has deceivingly awkward front vision i think it a lot of it has to do with the fact that this a pillar kind of comes down and from the driver's standpoint the a pillar is rather thick up here and you combine it with the mirror down here and it actually forms a pretty good block here that is completely out of your view when you're driving. So if you're in a position where like there's an oncoming car coming this way or you're facing a slight incline, you're looking down and the same thing exists on the other side too. Um, you really kind of have to be aware of that and kind of move your head out of the way of the A pillar. Um, otherwise you could really get yourself into a bad situation quick. And I know all, all the, every one of our family that has driven this vehicle has found themselves in exactly that situation. Matter of fact, I drove it yesterday, and um, in our town there's a, there's a three-way intersection, and the one kind of just comes off to the left. A full-size van was blocked from the driver's side, from the driver's seat. A full-size van was blocked by this thing completely. And had I not, like, actually moved my head around, I would have never seen it. <laughs> God help you if you have neck problems and moving your head around. 
I had a mechanic once who had some sort of neck fusion, so he has to turn his whole body to look around. He'd be screwed in this thing. <laughs> Although I think a mechanic would have a better sense than to drive this, but who knows? You're not a mechanic, are you? No, not really. Oh, no. Right, good. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's... All the lights inside the HVAC cluster are burned out, and but you can't replace them without replacing the entire unit because Daimler Chrysler uses bulbs that were soldered to a circuit board, and this is without even getting into the non-existent torque and the just, the, this is a paraphrase of the e the email that like Mike sent me, <laughs> but I actually find that a lot of what he kind of prepared me for was stuff that was dead on the money, because the throttle response is painful, and especially when you're easing up off the gas, there's sort of this like fluttery, um, queasy, like shuddering that happens on the front end of the car. There's this sense of unease, of th this tension, this nervousness to it, and I can't reconcile that with perceptions of the Jeep as this super overconfident car. This feels so tentative, like it's giving up before it even tries, you know? So you're putting your foot to the floor waiting for something to happen, and then nothing materializes. I mean, Mike was telling me about having problems with the factory battery because it literally exploded. You know, you had battery acid leaking and, and scuffing up all the pain and eating through things. And it's just a complete disaster. So you, you mentioned the acid marks on the side there. Yeah. Uh, that's because uh, way back when this thing was probably when we had it about maybe th probably about four years, the original factory battery literally exploded. Um, just happened one time my wife was starting it up and um, well you see the aftermath um, it just kind of blew up left a lot of smoke and uh, it was kind of a mess in there so I had to clean that up and take the battery out and try and wash it down the best I could but as you can see the damage was done which is even wilder to me because it wasn't an aftermarket battery. He ended up replacing it with an aftermarket battery from DECA, which is like the biggest employer in the Tri-County area around here. It's like everybody knows somebody who worked at DECA battery. And if you can see right here, his battery is just labeled the usable because when you shop at the DECA store, you get factory seconds. So somehow, like, DECA battery leftovers were better than what Chrysler was putting in their own car. Like, this is the battery Daimler Chrysler thought would be a good fit for suburban families. A weird humming sound coming from the rear. What is it? No one knows. Where does it start? Still, no one knows. How, how do you fix it? A uh, wild guess, but I'm going to assume no one knows. Really, I can't see how they expected this to appeal to anybody, much less the mom crowd. It does not care about her needs needs at all. This has all the energy of a husband asking how her day went and then thinking that's all he had to do as he drowns out the talk about the party they threw for Gina from HR to celebrate her divorce being finalized. And I mean, it sucks that it's come to this because it comes from a legacy of better cars. I mean, the history dates all the way back to the early 80s when AMC was working on designing the follow-up to the XJ, and everything sort of worked out so that the company streamlined and centralized the design process so that it was easier to iron out any issues with regards to design changes and engineering approaches. This is just a very basic Cliff Notes <laughs> version of the Grand Cherokee history. But basically, this approach meant all the documents and drawings related to the project were in one database. This made the production cycle far less complicated and far more cost-efficient as it promoted the harmony of divisions that normally were on completely different pages at times. The Grand Cherokee was launched in 1992 for the 1993 model year, just five years after Chrysler purchased AMC in 1987, with the ZJ serving as the first Jeep product to wear a Chrysler badge and it would go on to become one of the most iconic vehicles of the 90s. So, what went wrong? Well, it kind of feels like the entire design philosophy behind Jeeps was about cutting costs, so that everything just sort of feels... cheap. This Laredo has plastics that just feel awful. This is like a playground at the school that just had its budget cut. With this well, I mean, the one thing you're going to see, and I guess it's pretty standard for, for Mopar products of this area, but it's a sea of hard plastics. And what I mean, like hard, everything's hard. There isn't a soft touch surface in this vehicle anywhere. I mean, that's about the amount of cush that you get on the, on, on the actual door panel for where your elbows hit. 
you're already on this and you can see how far that pushes in i mean there is like zero tolerance for anything i mean it's basically just a sea of beige plastic that's it the textures don't really match the the brake handle i love how like basically the entire brake handle is one giant piece of plastic that they tried to separate with lines and different textures but it's really just one simple piece of plastic i mean you know it works it does its job i mean i guess that's the whole point of it you know it, it doesn't have to be pretty if it does its job which it does you'll notice that there's like a spot here that looks like a handy grab bag area but really what this is is in in like higher option jeeps this is where you would go into they have the switches here for going into like your four low basically as you can see, that's not here because this thing is uh, in basically four-wheel drive all the time. It's the base level package for that. does not have four low. So, I mean, it is a four-wheel drive vehicle, I guess. And for an ostensible family car, the back seats and legroom are Mustang and Chevy Spark levels of bad. All right, so as Mike was telling me, this has a an absolutely catastrophic lack of legroom in the back for what is nominally an SUV. It's sort of a different sort of way of getting to the family style car without actually having to buy a family car. But the problem is that you can't really fit your legs. All, you don't have a lot of room back here. This has all the thigh support of like a pair of Levi's. I've rarely since my Mustang kind of been in a car that had this amount or this relative lack of sort of movement. I'm a pretty short guy. I'm like five, seven and a half and a half, and my knees are like all the way up here. I mean, granted, it's not the worst in the world. Uh, maybe that's just me being super charitable. And of course you can always have the driver move the seat up, but. It, it, but one fair point is that the seat's not all the way back yet. Oh, oh there, there it actually is now. <laughs> oh, oh, all right. So, I mean, find the negative, Nick, find the negative. But even then, like, this isn't, like, the worst. <laughs> no, this is not great room back here. And the minute you become any older than, like, maybe 12, this would <laughs> become kind of cramped. But I feel like I'm coming at it from the standpoint of a guy who grew up in relatively small cars, who spent the last seven years driving a relatively, like, small car. And, yeah, I just, I don't hate this back seat necessarily even as i understand and recognize that this isn't ideal everything that's happening here is not ideal and i'm not talking about my crotch i'm just well although that is less than ideal but this is just all sort of you know whatever it's whatever and depending on trim the original msrp could climb as high as forty thousand dollars or more 40 large for this this is a car for people who see 60% off and think they're getting a deal for getting there at Crate and Barrel. And 60% off a fortune is still a fucking fortune. Nobody needs to pay upwards of four grand for a modular three-piece sofa and some stainless steel burger presses. And look, this wouldn't be such a huge deal breaker if the performance were great. But honestly, it's sluggish. I talked about it a bit earlier, but it really is shocking how sluggish this is. I put my foot to the floor and got a whole lot of nothing, just great big handfuls of bopkis. So if you just need a car, irrespective of whether or not you need it to do anything impressive or heavy duty, then this should be fine. But for me personally, I just don't, it doesn't feel like a Jeep, it's weird. Like, it's so weird to me, because if I were to drive this blindfolded, I mean, we'd be in a lot of trouble. But also, I don't know that I would be able to tell you what this was. I don't know, I would think it was one of the really sort of cheap Kias from the late 90s or something. There you go. That's a good, see oh. the front end? Oh, it's just so rattly. Yeah, it is. I mean, it feels like it's there's something to lose, but there isn't. That's just the way it is. It just <laughs> does this just to do it. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. I can just feel the 
the sunshine drain out of me as it continues. I got looks from people I tried to pass, accelerating and coming up short, drawing the scorn of truck drivers with forearm tattoos, men in constant preparation to compete in parking lot UFC, living out their fantasies in the octagon of the mind. Oh no, Rust Belt Randy has an iron deficiency and a taste for blood! All the while, he's ignoring his kid in the back seat as little Johnny continues asking more questions than a Doctor Who companion. I'll tell you where babies come from when you're 12! Or you can ask your mother and she'll tell you some fairy tale about pulling you out of a cabbage patch. There are so many other options, like a RAV4, an Outback, a Forester. Even buying American, I could imagine going for something like a Chevy Equinox or a Ford Escape. Of course, I haven't driven either, but I'd love a chance to see if either of those cars could even come close to inspiring this level of regret. Because I could imagine regretting this, and you want to know why? It's funny, because I, I really don't like this, but... If I'm completely honest, I could see myself like owning something like this. Not because, because, oh, camera got too hot. No, that was inside. a good place for it to die. <laughs> yes, I could imagine owning something like this because I already kind of do. My Mustang has all sorts of problems, and while I continue trying my best to save up money to buy something else before selling her, I recognize how much more I value a car that functions and doesn't have a thousand different problems. Because having a car break down is pain. Which brings us to some of the positives about this car. I've been listening to Rasta Man's channel, and one of the things I noticed that some cars don't do that this one does, it is allows you to take the uh, radiator support subframe from su radiator support subframe off, right there. There's two bolts there and two bolts there. So if you have to take the radiator out and a bunch of other stuff, you don't have to skin your knuckles to do it. This whole part on bolts there. So I'm saying one positive thing about well, this so far. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you another positive. Okay, so the one thing with the, with the if you have like the V8, you actually. You actually have two extra cylinders. I mean, all this really is, the 3.7 is basically just uh, the 4.7 V8 with two cylinders lopped off. That's really all it is. Uh, as you can see, you get an abundant amount of room. So, I mean, a couple of times I've had to replace the belt. I've had to replace a water pump on it. It's not for lack of space. I mean, you can really kind of get in there and do work on it if you need to. So, you know. Yeah, ch yeah check this out. You can see clearly. Check this out and take my hat. It goes right down there. Oh, it disappears. I almost got it last time I went right through the car. Ooh. Oh, almost. Oh. Uh, one of the things that I actually did like that this had and we used a lot was this basically just a regular normal plug rather than a cigarette outlet plug. Uh, don't know why more car companies don't do that, but uh, it's something that actually we, is really useful. You know, it's one of the things that I actually do like about this car. Basically, this was purchased for my wife. Real world, does she ever go off-road? No. Would she ever want it to go off-road? No. What would she want to do? She would want to go to work and back and, and putting her in, basically in Pennsylvania, you're going to be dealing with snow. Did it do well in that? Absolutely. It did exactly what it was supposed to do for that. So it wasn't like you were getting extra capacity just to say you had it. Yeah. Durability is an incredible thing. You see, the pain of a failing car has the same philosophical point of inspiration as say, going to the gym. If you're going to be in pain anyway, at least let it be the kind of pain that serves you. If you're going to drive a crappy car, at least let it be the kind of crappy car you can depend on. And in this sense, despite being the worst Jeep I've ever driven, it's been pretty impressive what Mike has been able to achieve with this thing. Despite leaking batteries and swollen nuts, this is currently sitting around 225,000 miles, still running the original engine and 5-speed automatic transmission. This, despite 2008 models being renowned for transmission issues appearing at around the 100,000 mile mark or just below. Mike says the only real maintenance to keep it running is changing the oil as necessary. And even then, Mike himself reports that this doesn't even burn a full quart between oil changes. But even if it did, it's a Dixie plate at a cookout. 
It's eminently disposable, so you can drive the hell out of this car without feeling guilty. Because it's a Laredo. Who cares? It has as much of a future as crypto. And despite a lot of Jeep enthusiasts refusing to truly recognize it as a Jeep, it is, for better or worse, a Jeep. And that has significance because it grants entry into a sort of benign social circle of people who have Jeeps in common. Maybe you won't make any lifelong friends off of owning a Laredo, but I've seen worse at car shows, if I'm honest. And I know what it's like to feel like your car is your ticket into conversations, especially being an introvert, where being lonely is often at odds with the desire to do anything about it. That's why cars can be such valuable tools for socializing. Because the people come to you and prompt every conversation. Being a car enthusiast is the path of least resistance when it comes to making friends as an adult in the real world. And this would be true of any model of car that commands a certain reaction from like-minded owners. Say what you will about how inconspicuous this car looks, but I feel like you're more likely to be able to commiserate over a Jeep than you are over something like a Hyundai or some random Kia or Cadillac. Your life is good. Things are good. And when you own a Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo, the implication is that you don't really need that much out of your car. And maybe you'll spring for something fancy one of these days, but right now there's a better chance of Chick-fil-A opening on a Sunday. I envy the Laredo owner. The noble spirit awash in the low stress of Sunday domesticity. Freed from the daily humiliation of living and released into the comforting arms of mechanic bills that don't exist. I can see value in this, even while recognizing that this is frankly just terrible. So I guess that sort of brings it back around to the question at the start of the video. Do I hate this car? Is Hate Hunt over after just one installment? Well, no. I don't like the car, but I don't hate it either. Because it runs. It's not a bad car, it's just not much of one. To win the hate hunt, a car has to be so bad that even the mere fact of its operation can't be overcome, that it can function flawlessly and never break down, yet still earn the same level of derision as two people engaged in another installment of stoplight theater. As we all sit in our cars waiting for the light to change at the intersection and watch a heated argument take place in the Nissan Altima in front of the 30-minute oil change, I never want to drive this car again. But I still have to give it credit for what it is, because it never tries to be more than a functional SUV. We should all probably get in the habit of recognizing the things worth commending about ourselves and others. Never giving yourself enough credit can be as harmful as giving yourself too much. And so I wanted to at least be fair to the Laredo. But it still sucks, though. Of course, I say that this is a terrible Jeep, but it's not the worst Jeep ever made. For that, you'll have to tune in to RCR this coming Monday for a car that Brian really didn't like. <laughs> See you then. And thank you to Mike, who's been a wonderful sport about everything and who is genuinely one of the nicest people that has ever been on RCR and offered one of the most pleasant filming experiences I can ever remember having. So shout out to Mike. And if you think you have the car, the car that can win the hate hunt, and you don't mind coming out to southeastern Pennsylvania, drop an email at regularcarstheroman at gmail.com. That's regularcarstheroman at gmail.com. I would love to be able to do one of these every month, so drop me a line. I hope you enjoyed this, and have a great rest of your week. Jeep Laredo is an awful option, but proceed with caution, don't despair. Oh, I don't want to have it all, I just want to be a pawn. I don't need a car that's new, I want to get